Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and a warm welcome to all of you to today's virtual workshop on financial stability lessons from COVID-19. My name is Dietrich Domanski. I am the Secretary General of the FSB. The pandemic is the first major test of the global financial system after the financial crisis of 2008. And this real-life test may hold important lessons for financial policy, including the functioning of G20 financial reforms. It is against this background that the Italian G20 presidency asked the FSB to identify preliminary lessons for financial stability from the COVID-19 experience. And in response to this request, we submitted an interim report on lessons learned to the July meeting of G20 finance ministers and central bank governors. Today's workshop provides an opportunity to provide feedback on this interim report. And this feedback will also serve as an input into the final report, which uh, we will deliver to the G20 in October. Now, there's a lot of interest in this topic. We have more than four, uh, 500 people actually registered for today's workshop. And uh, this is one of the few advantages of, of the current pandemic situation. It's the ability to have a much larger audience in our events and therefore to be able to hear directly from more of our stakeholders. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. The workshop is organized in two sessions, which correspond with the main sections of the interim report. The first session will focus on market and institutional resilience. It will be moderated by Eva Hübkes, Head of Regulatory and Supervisory Policy in the FSB Secretariat. And in the second session, we will then discuss operational resilience and crisis management preparedness. And this session will be moderated by Grace Sohn, Head of Cooperation and Organization in the FSB Secretariat. So before we turn to the first session, let me provide a quick overview of the main preliminary findings in the interim report, starting with market and institutional resilience. This is slide three, yeah. So the global financial system has weathered the pandemic thus far, thanks to greater resilience supported by G20 financial reforms and the swift, determined, and bold policy response internationally. Core parts of the system entered the pandemic in a more resilient state than the 2008 financial crisis. Large banks hold more capital, have more liquidity, and are less leveraged, which allowed them to cushion rather than amplify the macroeconomic shock. Financial market infrastructures, central counterparties in particular, functioned as intended. However, the pandemic experience also highlighted differences in resilience within and across financial sectors. Key funding markets experienced acute stress in March 2020, forcing authorities to take decisive and unprecedented action to sustain the supply of financing to the real economy, provide economic assistance, alleviate dollar funding shortages, and support market functioning. International standards overall provided sufficient flexibility to support an effective policy response during the pandemic. Reflecting jurisdiction-specific circumstances and needs, authorities broadly used the flexibility within international standards to support financing to the real economy. In a few cases, individual temporary measures have gone beyond the available flexibility in order to respond to extreme financial conditions and provide additional operational flexibility to financial institutions. Importantly, monitoring and coordination guided by the FSB COVID-19 principles has discouraged actions that could distort the level playing field and lead to harmful market fragmentation. Next slide, please. There are also a couple of aspects related to the functioning of the G20 financial regulatory reforms that may warrant further consideration at the international level, and I hope that we'll hear more about those uh, at uh, today's workshop. First is that the functioning of capital and liquidity buffers may warrant further considerations. Bank, banks generally did not need to use their capital and liquidity buffers to meet loan demand thus far. They maintained strong capital positions during the pandemic supported by public measures. However, there are indications that banks might be reluctant to dip into their buffers if needed to meet credit demand in spite of the flexibility in the regulatory framework. And while banks did not face large liquidity pressures overall, some took defensive actions to maintain their liquidity levels well above regulatory minima. Some concerns, next point, about excessive financial system procyclicality persist. 
Margin calls in some derivatives markets during the peak of the March 2020 turmoil may have been larger than expected or insufficiently anticipated by market participants, adding to the overall demand for cash. The actions of certain investors may have contributed to the amplification of liquidity imbalances and their propagation through the financial system. Regulatory requirements appear to have impacted dealer behavior in some markets at least. Moreover, mechanistic use of credit rating agency ratings, which have declined since 2008, may persist in, in some specific areas. And further work may also be needed to examine the potential procyclicality of the new expected credit loss accounting framework. Last but certainly not least, the March 2020 market turmoil has underscored the need to strengthen resilience in the non-bank financial intermediation sector. The impact of the COVID-19 event has highlighted vulnerabilities in the sector stemming from liquidity mismatches, leverage, and interconnectedness, which may have caused liquidity imbalances and propagated stress. The turmoil has also highlighted the importance of interconnectedness within the NBFI sector and with banks. Um, let me now turn to operational resilience and crisis management preparedness. Next slide. Oh, you have it already, thanks. Um, so precautionary lockdown measures tested the contingency plans of all financial market participants. And uh, financial institutions and market infrastructure successfully invoked business continuity plans and adopted work from home arrangements at short notice, very short notice actually. Notwithstanding new challenges, financial institutions have generally been able to continue operations in this mode for a much longer period than expected, ensuring that financial markets remained open and orderly, despite, in some cases, significantly increased trading volumes. This experience underscores the importance of effective operational risk management arrangements being in place before a shock hits. Now, work from home arrangements also propelled the adoption of new technologies and accelerated digitalization in financial services. Outsourcing to third-party providers such as cloud services seems to have enhanced operational resilience at financial institutions. But increased reliance on such services may also give rise to new challenges and vulnerabilities. Effective management of such risks across the supply chain is essential to, mitigate, uh, to mitigating operational and cyber risk. Looking ahead, COVID-19 therefore underlines the need to promote resilience amidst rapid technological change. In particular, the boost that the pandemic seems to have given to digital financial services has put the spotlight on operational resilience in an environment of greater reliance on outsourcing and third-party service providers, including on a cross-border basis. Next slide, please. Authorities should also take steps to further enhance crisis management preparedness. Cross-border mechanisms established in recent years, such as supervisory colleges and crisis management groups, facilitated timely and effective information sharing and cooperation among authorities. Scenario-based stress tests helped authorities to adjust their policies, while recovery and re resolution planning have improved firms' capabilities. Clear communication to the industry and the public has helped to support the effectiveness of policy measures. Nevertheless, there are opportunities to enhance information sharing arrangements further, including cross-border, and to continue to adapt supervisory and regulatory policies to the changing underlying circumstances, including by addressing identified data gaps and enhancing analytical tools. Efforts should also continue to put in place credible liquidity arrangements for times of stress and resolution. Next and last slide, please. So, looking ahead, it is important to bear in mind that the lessons identified in, 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 in the report and by our work so far are preliminary. The pandemic is not yet over and uh, it may still test the resilience of the global financial system. And identifying systemic vulnerabilities early on therefore remains a priority. A couple of points on that. The current level, low level of corporate insolvencies seems predicated on continued policy support. Banks and non-bank lenders could still face additional losses as these measures are unwound. Recent bank stress tests suggest that the largest banks are well capitalized and will remain resilient under a range of recovery scenarios. 
Yet there may be questions about banks' willingness to sustain real economy financing in an environment of deteriorating non-financial sector credit quality, particularly if there is an inherent, an inherent reluctance to use buffers. Moreover, asynchronous economic cycles and large differences in interest rates could induce disorderly capital outflows from emerging markets as dollar-denominated investments are suddenly reallocated across jurisdictions. One of the legacies of the pandemic may be a buildup of leverage and debt overhang in the non-financial sector. Rapid and large credit support has increased debt levels, especially in the hardest hit sectors. Addressing debt overhang, including by facilitating um, the, the market exit of unviable companies and an efficient reallocation of resources to viable firms may be a key task for policymakers going forward. Um, last point, the COVID-19 experience, I think, reinforces the importance of completing remaining elements of the G20 reform agenda. Those parts of the global financial system where implementation of post-crisis reforms post-2008 crisis reforms is most advanced, displayed particular resilience. This underlines the financial stability benefits of the full, timely, and consistent implementation of agreed reforms, including with respect to Basel III, OTC derivatives, resolution frameworks, and non-bank financial intermediation. It's also important, remains important, to evaluate whether these reforms are working as intended, including how macroprudential policy approaches have functioned in practice. So, so much for the, the background to today's discussion. And before I now pass on to Eva, let me just make a few quick housekeeping remarks. Uh, in each session, three uh, distinguished discussions will lead us off. We'll come to that in a minute. Following these lead-off interventions, we will open the floor to all participants for comments we will ask anyone who wants to speak during this discussion to raise their hand virtually. You have the hand raising button at the uh, bottom, bottom right of your, your WebEx screen. Um, participants will also have a chance to send questions using the Q&A function. Um, given the purpose of, of this workshop to solicit feedback on lessons learned, um, we would suggest prioritizing comments on lessons learned over questions. Throughout the call, participants should please mute their lines and switch off video unless they speak to preserve bandwidth capacity. Um, last but not least, we will record this event and make it available on the FSB website. So with that, um, let me hand over to Eva for the first session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dietrich. I am Eva Hübkes, Head of Regulatory and Supervisory Policies at the FSB Secretariat, and it is my great pleasure to share this first session of the workshop, which will focus on market and institutional resilience. Um, we have three distinguished lead discussants who will kick off the discussion. Let me introduce them in the order of their interventions. First, Davide Serra, who is the founder, chief executive officer, and chief investment officer of Algebras Investments. Then Laura Cordres, who is consultant and former distinguished senior fellow of the Gollop Center for Finance and Policy at MIT Sloan School of Management. Laura continues to be associated with the Gollop Center in a teaching capacity, and she also has been with the IMF for more than 24 years. I think we actually overlapped two years there. Finally, we have Anil Kashab, who is the Stevens Distinguished Service Professor of Economics and Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. So following the three lead interventions, we will open the floor to our audience. Please either raise your hand or submit your comment in writing. We will do our best to accommodate everybody in the very limited time of 50 minutes that is reserved for this discussion. To allow for the maximum of interventions, we ask all those who speak to keep their remarks brief. For the lead discussants, this is three minutes, and for those from the audience, it is one minute. So, without further ado, let me turn to Davide, whom I've asked to give us his uh, real-world perspective on the pandemic event and the resilience of the financial system. Davide? Thank you so much, Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity given. Uh, my remarks will be centered on uh, five issues and basically five events and names. And I'll go by size of the market, 
So first of all, let me say that we think as one of the largest investor across bank capital structure, equity, credit, and senior, we think that the G20 work in resiliency of the banking system has been superb. We had one in a hundred year shock pandemic, which happened by the way over the last five century, and the banking system this time was actually a strength uh, that allows us to come out of the pandemic, providing the liquidity and being a shock absorber to the real world. Secondly, though, there are five lessons that we've learned. The first one, U.S. Treasury market. There are seven to eight players with leverage of 89 times that were abusing repo facility out of the banking system. This was basically allowed because as far as the regulator is concerned, U.S. Treasury is safe. Eventually, it was about 300 billion mismatch on lever player eight to nine times, and that led to cash treasury being a six to eight percent discount to futures. That led basically to a fast unwind, and for a few days, the U.S. Treasury market was less liquid than any other market. I think this is a huge issue. We cannot afford to have players on eight to nine times leverage on U.S. Treasury. Secondly, embedded liquidity pools. Whether it's daily usage fund or ETF, if there's anyone that has a recourse to cash out of the banking system, in the case of ETFs, they are exchange traded fund and banks trade them. There can be cyber loop implication between banks providing more capital and cash for the trading of these instruments. Uh, and as a result, I think in particular in the US, some ETF were under stress uh, for a couple of days, simply because the banking had the banks had to provide more liquidity and capital for a few period of days. Eventually, the Fed intervention released all this pressure, but it's something that we never expected. We think that asset management required 20 to 30 basis points of equity as percentage of AUM as a proper level of capital. And I think every player in the industry should debate to that rule, whether listed or not listed. Third, the lesson we learned is call the activity by their names. So in our case, Greensill, total return swap, must be disclosed as anything else, you know, not because you know whoever does the activity is a different name. And last but not least, and I'll stop, the case of uh, Green Seal and Wirecard. Two of the biggest fraud happened in Europe, uh, one in Germany, one in the UK, simply because they called a normal banking activity with something else. So not because of how you call yourself or because of a legal entity, what matters is what you do. And it's the underlying. So rather than regulation by the legal entity, I would keep on focusing regulation by the underlying. This to prevent the few mistakes that have happened through this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Davide. Uh, let's turn us to another focus area of the FSB report. The FSB report concludes that the functioning of bank capital and liquidity buffers warrants further consideration. So, Laura, turning to you. Did the buffers end up being usable? Why or why not? And do you have any suggestions for making them more usable? Well, thank you first for the opportunity to, prevent, to present my views. Um, let me just note that these are my personal views, not the views of the Golub Center for Finance and Policy with which I'm associated. Um, first, let me reiterate a point that Dietrich made, which was that we entered the crisis with large internationally active banks uh, with high levels of capital and liquidity, and that certainly was an aid to the situation. The question, though, I think before us is, uh, was the release of the bank's buffers needed? And apparently not. And so one major question we should ask is, why not? Perhaps one reason was that the credit support programs primarily aimed at SMEs, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. So most of the new lending was done by medium-sized banks and smaller banks, uh, fintech lending platforms, and in particular, non-bank financial intermediaries. Uh, a second reason that banks' buffers might not have been used was that there were a flood of deposits that arrived at too big to fail banks, particularly in the US and the UK. And so there was no need to use uh, excess liquidity nor their capital buffers to maintain the existing loan growth. In some cases, these, uh, these buffers arrived from non-financial corporates drawing down their credit lines and then uh, 
putting them in as uh, deposits. And lastly, you know, both risk weighted capital ratios and leverage ratios were bolstered by other policy measures. And so what may be uh, non buffer use was in fact buffer use, but it would be difficult to distinguish that. So would they have been used had they been needed? Uh, my personal view is it's unlikely that the capital buffers would have been used. First, dipping into any prescribed capital ratio would cause banks to look undercapitalized and affect their ability to obtain funding and their ability to issue shares. So there is an element of uh, market stigma attached to the use of the buffers. Secondly, the time frame for rebuilding the buffers was uncertain. Thirdly, the impact of dropping below the capital conservation buffer would automatically circumscribe banks' ability to pay out dividends, make share purchases, repurchases, and pay bonuses, including in areas that were unrelated to the pandemic's impact. Fourthly, the post-pandemic unwinding of forbearance is likely to put pressure on capital ratios, and banks want to be prepared for that. In fact, even before many of these measures, they did prepare for this by including more provisioning. What about the liquidity buffers? Again, dipping below the liquidity coverage ratio entails funding risks, especially given the lack of high quality liquid assets that occur during stress periods. And in this particular period, the Treasury market, the US Treasury market was under, was under distress. Certainly the dash for cash that appeared uh, during March of 2020 supported the bank's cautionary stance. And it was li it's likely that they will remain uh, in a cautionary stance for future events of this nature. What about the countercyclical capital buffer? That's the only buffer that was actually built to be released. Um, it is true that by those authorities that had implemented it, it was released but only 14 of 44 countries that have agreed to use the CCYB had in fact used it and had any buffer to release. And the ones that didn't have any buffers include Canada, the US, Japan, China, and Singapore, large countries for which this effect uh, was uh, pretty, pretty impressive. There were also implicit ways of releasing the buffers. So it's really difficult to tell from a market perspective or even from a supervisory perspective whether or not the buffers were in fact used. There were lower risk weights associated with certain types of investments. Non-performing loans and provisioning rules were relaxed and there was an encouraged flexible interpretation of the new through the cycle IFRS 9 rules. Many of the loans were explicitly guaranteed. And lastly, Central bank reserves and government securities were excluded from the leverage ratio, bolstering that ratio as well. So the bottom line is internationally active banks are unlikely to use their buffers, even if they were available. And at this point, we can only surmise whether they were in fact used given the other policy reforms. Let me just put on the table for discussion several fixes that I think could move in the direction of allowing these buffers to, to be utilized. And keeping in mind that these are my own suggestions. So again, this, uh, this may generate some discussion. Certainly building big enough buffers during good times is key. And then providing explicit incentives to use them during the downturn is also key. I would call this more carrots and fewer sticks. So the first one would be to build enough buffers during good times. Use the CCYB aggressively and quickly. The fact that it takes nearly a year to get to the next level of a tightening of the CCYB is far too long in this today's world of this environment. Raise the CCB, the, the, uh, the um, capital conservation buffer, and include an interconnectedness macroprudential component. This is different than a cyclical component. Remove the constraints on dividends, share repurchases, and bonuses. Let banks decide how best to use their capital. Provide monetary rewards for the use of the buffers. Job-owning banks is just not enough, nor are these under-the-table giveaways on risk-weighted assets and reduction of non-performing loans. 
build the credibility of supervisors by providing clear expectations, both on the rebuild of the buffers, the use of forbearance, and provide guidance about how non-viable borrowers should be treated ex post. And lastly, make the buffers contingent, the buildup of buffers contingent on the situation, not a time bound uh, environment for, for building the buffers. And uh, in this regard, I, I think the, the um, statement that it depends on market conditions is always, um, you know, one of those weasel words where it's really not that helpful either in this crisis or in previous crisis. Let me last just note and reemphasize that the focus on capital and liquidity buffers has been in the banking sector. And what we have seen is that the non banking financial intermediation sector NBFIs, is still where the residual risks end up when banks can't or won't respond, given their stricter regulations. It's rather striking that 12 plus years after the GFC, there still has been very little progress on taking care of the NBFI sector, despite what I would call one of the most excellent reports that the FSB puts out on this topic. I'll stop here, but um, hopefully I've generated some conversation with my suggestions for fixes. Thank you, Laura. Let me now turn to Anil, who will be um, tell us about uh, what he thinks uh, post-crisis reforms um, have kept up with the evolution of the financial system. Okay, thank you, Ava. And I just want to echo the fact that I'm also speaking in my personal capacity, so you shouldn't assign these views to the Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee. Um, the interim consultation document from the FSB does a good job of highlighting many of the key fault lines that were exposed at the outset of the pandemic. I share Laura's concern about buffer usability. Uh, there's a lot in the report about pro-cyclicality and I didn't think it was a good use of my time to just repeat those points. So I'm going to instead focus on two areas that didn't get as much attention uh, that I hope uh, maybe will get more attention in the final report. The first of these has to do with the antiquated measurement system that we're living with. Uh, the global financial system has increasingly moved away from being bank based, but the way we measure things has not kept up. Kept up. And the, the gaps involve both high frequency patterns and low frequency ones. Um, so let me give two examples. Both of the two previous speakers have highlighted the acute problems in the treasury market last March. And, and you know, market is often described as the deepest, most liquid market in the world, yet it froze up and required massive purchases by the Federal Reserve to be stabilized. Nonetheless, when you look back at that period, we still haven't been able to do a full forensic accounting of exactly who was buying and selling and why and how all the interconnections in the system work. And as the market uh, has become more stressed here, we, we should be able to figure out what the triggers were and what the amplifiers were. And, and that you know has reared itself again last month. We, we saw more of this stress. So this is staring us in the face and, and it doesn't seem to be attended to. As a second example, let's take a, a slower moving issue, the leveraged loan market. Now there's been an explosion of this type of lending over the last few years, and lots and lots of financial stability reports often point to this market as one that could cause stability problems. For example, if there was a deep and persistent fire sale, that would basically shut down the primary market and then cause a credit crunch. Yet our insights into the holding of these securities is poor, and, and here's a, concrete example. In March of, uh, uh, sorry, in November of 2018, both the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England put out financial stability reports pointing to the risks coming from these markets. And yet at the time, the estimates of the size of the market, just the basic size of the market, forget who holds it, was off by $1 trillion. Now, if that's not real money that gets your attention, I don't know what it takes. So I think we could do a lot more on measurement. It's boring, but it's important. And um, we, we really need to focus on that. The other risk I wanna highlight is the unevenness of risk management practices across major financial institutions. Some of the lessons and practices that I thought had been permanently ingrained after the 2008 global financial crisis seem to have been forgotten. And for the example I'll use here, let's look at the collapse from the fallout of um, Archigo's capital management. Now, 
This is a family office that reportedly had assets of roughly 10 billion. Yet, according to published reports, say from the Financial Times, they generated losses on the same order of magnitude for its prime brokers. And there's two things about this example that I find striking. First, Bill Wang, the owner of Archigos, had been banned from trading in, in Hong Kong uh, uh, for four years and had paid a fine to the SEC for insider trading. Yet he was able to establish prime brokerage relationships with multiple global systemically important banks. And if you believe the FT, the fees he was paying were de minimis. Uh, Credit Suisse apparently made only $17.5 million in fees in the year prior to the firm's collapse and yet managed to lose $5.4 billion. So the first question is, how was he able to get so much exposure from firms that should have known better? The second startling thing about this case is once the trouble at Archigos arrived, many of the exposed banks caucused about what to do and reached very different decisions. Goldman Sachs uh, and possibly others uh, managed to untangle themselves while taking little or no losses as far as we can tell. Others took very big losses. Why did so many large brokers stay away completely and exit immediately while others couldn't, uh, couldn't get out or chose not to? The fact that the best practices for something as routine as just providing funding to a mid-sized family office can be so different, even amongst the most sophisticated global institutions worries me. What does that mean about their ability to manage much more complicated and subtle risks that are new and evolving? And are supervisors up to the job of being able to spot these problems before something much bigger blows up? I just don't think we can count on the firms to do this on their own. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks very much, Anil, and thank you, David and Laura, for your clear and very focused interventions. Uh, I'll come back to you uh, quickly before this session ends, but I would like to now open the floor to our audience. So those who would like to comment, please press the virtual hand symbol on the right side of your WebEx screen. And uh, let me see, do we already have a... Uh, yes, Richard Porters, please. On mute. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, I'll speak quickly, but from the perspective of the European Systemic Risk Board, uh, but these are not ESRB views, they're my own. On bank capital, we did uh, end up with a recommendation uh, that was implemented by the uh, SSM in Europe um, and other non Euro uh, zone. Uh, authorities uh, for restriction of dividends and buybacks. Uh, and it is only now that we are coming to a decision on ending those restrictions fully, though they have been relaxed. Um, I think that was useful um, the, in, and, and, and that um, it was important to keep bank capital uh, uh, preserved insofar as possible. It is true that there are buffers. And it is true, Laura Codris was quite right, the banks didn't want to use the buffers. And that did, as far as we can tell, have an effect, a negative effect on lending activity. Um, so second point, uh, on money market funds, nobody said it explicitly, but of course that was one of the big uh, issues. Um, and that is something that we are currently considering in the ESRB, uh, there will be a, uh, there is a, a revision under underway of the regulation the regulations uh, governing money market funds, uh, and that is, a, shall I say, a subject of live discussion this autumn, uh, and we should have some output from that discussion uh, fairly mm -hmm. soon. Fairly soon. Um, on uh, uh, an issue ahead, um, yes, the CCPs uh, performed quite well under stress. But there are still concerns there. And again, this is an issue in particular in Europe. Uh, it will be an issue because uh, the question arises of whether uh, the biggest clearinghouse, London LCH, should be, should, whether recognition by the EU authorities should continue. If that recognition uh, is denied, and this is again currently under discussion, then the uh, there may be significant financial stability 
implications. Uh, and uh, finally, on, um, uh, on non-bank financial institutions, uh, we have a report too. I think it's very good. And the annual, the, the, the latest annual version came out on Monday. Um, and there's a lot in there about the risks, the NBFI risks. Um, and there's no doubt that we uh, were certainly very active in trying to formulate uh, the best ways to approach some of the issues that were raised uh, earlier. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, let me turn back to Davide, who would like to react to some points that were, were raised, and uh, thereafter we'll go to Andres. But, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to make two further points. So the first one is that I shared with you that the Bank of England and the ECB decision to suspend the dividends and de facto bonuses, I think was the appropriate decision. Because what that triggered was a stability of the funding market for banks. And with credit in banks being ultra stable, given a leverage de facto on a nominal basis of 15 times to one, basically allowed the core of the lending business uh, to keep on going with no disruption. And so I think the lesson learned in, in crisis make sure that your basement is secure. So if you think pre-crisis, we had about three, four floor of equity out of hundreds of assets, we're now 15. I think the key to keep the you know, skyscraper stable is make sure that your basement is ultra strong. And as a result, I think as an investor, we welcome that decision and the time framework. And by the way, suspending dividends does not mean the capital is going away, remains inside. And you know, bonuses and dividend can be paid two, three, four years later after the event. Given it's a one and a hundred year shock, I think they did very well. And I think, by the way, the Fed should have done the same this time around. I don't know why they didn't, but had I been the regulator, I would have done it. And as an investor, I would have welcomed the decision because the risk is having one that fails. Secondly, I think the role of contingent capital was key. Why? Suddenly, look at the Credit Suisse case. So we had de facto two frauds. One, Grinsel, actual fraud. And two, we had Articles, de facto, another fraud. We had 10 of equity and 120 of gross exposure and not disclosed, by the way, <laughs> with a guy that was you know, reprimanded by the SEC. So not, let's say, a saint. And um, so now we have in a situation whereby suddenly a bank managed to lose this something which is equivalent to 200 times VAR, or uh, has gross exposure uh, basically three times uh, the legal limit as a large exposure because badly reported and massive failure of risk management. So let's say it's the classic uh, black swan event. Well, guess what? Nothing has happened to Credit Suisse credit. Nothing has happened to depositor, nothing to clients. Why? There was a huge buffer of contingent capital so that every investor knew, worst come to worst, that contingent capital gets converted into equity. So there was a pre-funded rights issue inside the capital structure. And that, in my view, has actually highlighted how illuminated were regulated when post-2009 created the contingent capital buffer, which now stands between tier one and tier two to three, four points of capital. Because in the event of what I would call you know, the biggest loss I've ever seen uh, accumulated in one shot by two uncorrelated events, Greensill and uh, Archegos, uh, the bank was safe and sound. They managed to raise two billion equity within two weeks um, and basically was no panic. And so I think well done to those that created the capital is now about a trillion. If you think the cash equity inside the banking system globally is about six trillion. So we are now 15% of pre-funded rights issue for the world to use in cases needed. And that means if you ever have a single uh, company event, in this case, Credit Suisse, nothing happens because you know, there's people that get converted from credit into equity within a clear regulatory framework. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Davide. Let me now turn to Andres Portilla and uh, then Barbara Nowak. 
Thank you, Eva and Dietrich, for the opportunity and respite with the Institute of International Finance. Um, just, just three comments. I, I, I like to um, share the analysis that Laura did about the capital buffer usage. It, her analysis really coincides with, with the one that the IIF has done and with what I would describe as the general understanding within the banking industry. But I think one of the main points that she made, and I think it's important to, to understand it, is that we haven't really tested uh, the capital buffers because in this crisis, banks did not need to use them. There was no need to use those buffers to continue with the lending and credit activity. So, so we continue to, I guess, have a um, hypothesis of what would have happened, but we don't know. And this, this crisis, luckily, I would say, didn't test that situation. And I think she said it, but I, I, I wanted to emphasize that. And then we can say, well, had they need them, what would have been the reaction? And I think um, her analysis was, was also correct in terms of the stigma and conditions attached to such usage. Second, uh, Professor Portis mentioned that the lack of using those uh, buffers may have uh, resulted in, in constraints in capital or reducing um, credit uh, capacity. Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, we at the IIF, together with the Financial Services Forum and ISDA, have done an analysis, and I don't um, that we produce in a, a report uh, from a, a few uh, weeks ago. Um, we did not see that that situation, so I would be interested in in looking at that data. And then my last comment is the paradoxical situation that the the, the reforms and the regulatory framework that resulted from the 2010 crisis, um, the 2008 and 9 crisis, um, was well suited to get the banking system in that situation of capital and liquidity strength that was demonstrated by this crisis, but at the same time is not well suited for this type of crisis. And by that, I mean that um, it was not suited for a crisis where banks were expected to expand the balance sheet and continue lending. It is a framework that is um, devised to respond to the typical crisis, which is to restrict and reduce credit and reduce the size of the balance sheet of banks as a reaction to such crisis. But in this crisis, we need to do the opposite. And hence, the leverage ratio limitations, the provision and framework exceptions, all those were flexibilities that were needed to, introduce, to be introduced so that banks could continue playing their lending and credit role. And that is a typical of a, I would say, a typical, um, you know, credit uh, or crisis situation. I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Let me um, turn to Barbara. Uh, we have a few minutes left, and then uh, maybe one more speaker, Ulrich Karl, before we conclude. Barbara? Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I will, as many speakers said, um, be speaking in my personal capacity and my personal views. Um, first thing I wanted to um, say is I think Anil hit it on the head, the measurement issue and the ability to track either the size of markets, uh, who are the holders, who is selling um, the treasury market being a great example where the Fed put out data showing that it wasn't hedge funds that were deleveraging, but it was actually non-US investors who were selling. And there's just no granularity on that. Um, and often NBFI is considered the equivalent of mutual funds, but mutual funds are actually a small subset of that. Second thing is, I'm actually quite concerned in both the reports that I read and in the conversation today, everybody talks about the bank's success. And in fact, I would agree that they came in very strong, um, that they continue to lend. But what's always omitted in that is, do they have a role as market makers? 
And if their role as market makers is only in times of good liquidity, then they're not really market makers. And we have to grapple with this and decide what is their role in times of stress in terms of market making. And if the answer is, and it's perfectly fine if this is the answer, the answer is they don't have a role, then we need to double down on addressing market structure. Um, I'll point out that the G30 did a report in July, which outlined a number of ideas specific for the treasury market from a standing repo facility, the central clearing to improve trace reporting and a host of others. Uh, but they only address treasuries. And I would say the same issues are painfully apparent in the commercial paper market and in other markets. Um, in terms of money market funds, um, there are a number of reports out and proposals as well. I think the obvious number one issue is this decoupling of fees and gates from the liquidity buffer. Here you had funds with a 30% liquidity buffer and they were not able to use them. So rather than drawing down on their buffers in a time of stress, they were actually scrambling to raise more cash in a, a pro-cyclical way. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, some people might say, well, we don't want money market funds, and that's a policy decision of its own. But assuming we want money market funds and we think they play an important role in the capital markets, that would be the most important thing to look at. Um, unfortunately, a number of the proposals that are on the table are what we would call unworkable options that we know that they would lead to the end of the money market funds. Better to just eliminate them than to go down um, a Rube Goldberg type path to get there. And then lastly, I wanted to focus for a minute on open end funds and anti-dilution measures. Um, Brookings did a very good workshop and paper on swing pricing in particular. We know that swing pricing works. We have it available in some jurisdictions, especially um, in Europe. We do not have it available in the United States. And it is the number one thing coming out of this crisis that we would like to see available. Um, I would point out there were very, very few fund suspensions and the ones that were, were very idiosyncratic um, for reasons in the local markets, but very small AUM, very small number of funds overall. That said, um, we didn't get the real test because the Fed did step in we don't know what would have happened had they not stepped in. Um, and we thank them for the things that they did as well as other central banks. But I think that swing pricing is something that should be available in, like I said, in all jurisdictions. Um, and I think lastly, um, CCP, somebody mentioned, there is a buy side, sell side coalition letter that's been out for a while, actually, um, since before COVID. And it outlines a number of reforms that are recommended for CCPs to make them more resilient since they are a source of concentrated risk. And the procyclicality of the margin during COVID was just one example of where CCPs um, participate and perhaps exacerbate um, some of these situations. Good to have them. Um, I think much better than the pre-global financial crisis situation. Um, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be looked at and, and maybe tinkered a little bit on the regulations. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Barbara. And if there is uh, anyone else in the audience who would like to uh, come in and intervene, please raise your hand now. We can accommodate a couple of more speakers. But let me now turn to uh, Ulrich Karl, please. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> thanks for organizing this conference and thanks for uh, letting me have a quick, uh, quick intervention. So I really just want to come back to the intervention of Richard Porters and Barbara Novick as well on CCPs. Um, so I think uh, I'm fully agree with CCPs did very well to, through, uh, through a crisis, but uh, some kind of showed higher margin procyclicality than others. But uh, what I really want to applaud and reinforce is uh, Richard's statement that uh, 
Um, maybe the crisis has even shown uh, kind of how important it is to have kind of a wide range of CCPs and that, uh, that uh, um, users of CCPs have a choice in having fallbacks uh, in a crisis, even if we luckily didn't need any of that. Uh, so really want to uh, kind of uh, underline, reinforce uh, the statement that uh, de-recognizing uh, UK CCPs uh, would certainly be not a good thing for, uh, for financial stability and especially might uh, make the system more uh, um, yeah, more dangerous in uh, in stress periods like last year. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Richard Portis, you'd like to <laughs> come back. Yeah, just uh, two quick points. One... I don't uh, see any... Sorry? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, two quick points. One is um, there is research recent research on uh, the fall off in bank lending, big bank lending in Europe uh, during, uh, uh, during the crisis. Um, and I'll try to, I'll try to uh, um, point that out um, uh, specifically uh, when I can get a, get a moment. Second, oh, uh, Anil's point about data, hugely important. We have data that we're not using. Uh, the EMIR database, of derivatives transactions in Europe uh, and the AI, new, newly available, in fact, AIFMD uh, database uh, for non-bank financial institutions. Um, these are both wonderful resources that are not being used. There was an item in the FT yesterday uh, about HKMA uh, thinking of using uh, real-time uh, derivatives transactions data uh, to um, warn of uh, dangers in the markets. I think this is, Europe is certainly capable of doing this, um, and it's something that ought to be done. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised at this point, therefore I, uh, well, I give uh, a few more seconds to see if anybody else would like to come in before then turning back to our three lead discussants to see if they have any reactions uh, to uh, the comments we have received. Okay, so let me then... Um, Follow the same order, Davide, Laura, and Anil, over to you briefly. Thank you. Still on mute. Sorry, who's um Avia il microfono accesso. speaking. Can you um, um, maybe let me start with uh, Laura? Are you there? Thank you very much. Um, I so just, your uh, brief reactions. Yes, um, you know I'd like to uh, second to Neil's comment on data. I've been associated with the data gaps uh, initiative uh, many years ago in trying to uh, obtain more data, have it be more granular, have it be released and publicly available for research for um, market participants. And um, on that note, let me just uh, make a comment on procyclicality. Um, you know, this is a topic where really there are multiple elements of procyclicality, some of which are built into the system um, by regulation itself, and some of which are what I would call um, behavioral or extrapolative expectations. And I think it's important that um, uh, policymakers attend to the underlying causes of the procyclicality. 
Um, and with regard to, for example, the uh, margin calculations, you know, it is in a CCP's interest to ensure that they have enough initial margin during a period of stress to accommodate, you know, a failure of one of their clearing members. And so it's very natural for them to increase uh, margin during those periods. And I think the key there would be to make sure that the margin calculations are visible and interpretable. And uh, so market participants can can do their own stress test of how much margin is going to be required if markets um, are highly volatile. Uh, there could be some more smoothing, you know, in terms of how margin is calculated so it's not so abrupt. But I think, you know, those are the kinds of me mechanistic uh, parts of the pro-cyclicality which can be addressed easily. The ones that are less easy to address are ones that are associated with the psychology of market participants. And of course, uh, pro-cyclicality of, of liquidity is one where that's very difficult because of the psychology of hoarding liquidity during um, periods of stress. And you know, that's a very difficult level of pro-cyclicality to, to address. But my, my goal would be that um, pro the, the causes, the underpinning causes of pro-cyclicality get a little bit more attention before uh, moving forward with policy recommendations. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Anil, do you have any reactions to uh, what was discussed during the sessions? No, I mean, I think almost every intervention was sensible and uh, there, there were many um, disagreements, I would say. Um, since various people are talking their book, I'll just note that I was part of the Brookings University of Chicago Task Force report that talked about some of these same issues. Um, we we think through the cycle margining would be a much, much better way to, to run the margin practices. But these, these, um, these things are difficult. I think, uh, as Barbara said, swing pricing would be a, a good uh, a good place to start, uh, particularly in the US uh, where, where it's not done. I mean, we've, this is a case where we've actually seen it work in Europe and the US is uh, reluctant to, to move ahead. Uh, there's some difficult operational things that are to be done, but I, I think uh, we we could make much much more progress or get a lot of the benefits without necessarily destroying the market. So you know I think there's more to do. It's it's good that there's so much agreement that the non-bank financial system is um, is under appreciated or has received too little attention. I hope this push will will bring it. Um, I, the last thing I'll say is that right now is a good time to be pushing, at least for people that are worried about the U.S. dragging its feet, because I think the, tre the current Treasury team is very, very aware of these, these matters. And um, I, I hope while Janet Yellen is Treasury Secretary, we can make a push on this because uh, she very much is kind of on record uh, pointing out these difficulties. And so uh, this this is the time to to proceed. We stop there. Th thank you, Anil. And uh, finally, Davide, uh, do you have any final thoughts or reactions before we conclude this section? Yeah. Thank you. I want to say that I fully agree with what Laura said meaning from the public official sector, rather than keep on uh, regulating, I think forcing disclosure would actually lead to a better end result. So let's be pragmatic. Had total return swap been disclosed as they are legally required to be disclosed in Europe, for example, Archegos would have not been able to happen. It happened in the States on Chinese stocks, and US stocks, uh, because in Europe, it could have not happen. At the same time, the full disclosure of the activity of your lending, had it happened in, for example, Greensill or Wirecard, there is a reason why it happened in Europe and didn't happen in the States. So the lesson learned, particularly for market activity, let market-based participant be on your side. And we can regulate very well, as long as we know. And hence, providing full disclosure uh, like the filing of 13F for equity, uh, rather than in Europe, all the uses disclosure, all that adds to, let's say, a shared risk management system 
whereby investor and market participant keep everyone in check. And uh, I would facilitate this certainly for US Treasury and for any other market that has systemic implication. Thank you, Davide, and thank you, everybody, for their valuable contributions. Um, we and FSB Mendev will reflect on these as we finalize the report for the G20. So let me now pass the baton to my colleague, uh, Grace Sohn, who will moderate the session on operational resilience and crisis management. Thank you, Ava. I'm Grace Sohn, I'm Head of Cooperation and Organization at the FSB Secretariat, and I look forward to moderating this discussion on operational resilience and crisis management preparedness. So similar to the previous session, we have invited three distinguished speakers to help us open the discussion. So let me introduce them in the order of their interventions. So first, we have Jason Harrell, um, Head of External Engagements, Operational and Technology Risk at DTCC. Um, he will be followed by Daniette DiPiero, Vice President and Senior Counsel at American Bankers Association. And then we will have Sasha Steffen, Professor of Finance at Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. Similar to the previous session, um, following their remarks, we will open the floor to all participants. So um, without further ado, let me turn to Jason, who will share his views on lessons from the COVID event from the perspective of a CCP. So while the FSB report notes and the previous session mentioned that CCPs functioned as intended, there are some lessons to be drawn from the operational challenges during the pandemic. Jason, um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Grace. I appreciate the intro. Um, so for operational resilience, uh, it's the ability to resume operations in a safe but rapid uh, manner in the face of numerous ha hazards to provide reasonable assurance of the safety and soundness of the financial system. Given that de definition, the pandemic has certainly tested aspects of financial services industry res resilience. Work from home capabilities were tested across all financial sectors we adopted new technologies to facilitate collaborative uh, environments normally found in office settings. Um, we uh, uh, operational or we adopted operational processes like employee onboarding, printing from home, um, other activities normally requiring a physical presence. Our collective staff have had to withstand numerous phishing emails using the pandemic as clickbait. For example, COVID relief sites, uh, heat maps, uh, COVID medical information, and COVID donations. All of these attempts trying to take advantage of a distracted employee base. Through it all, financial institutions have identified opportunities to streamline operations, develop processes that may require less of a human touch, and further enhance the client experience, and continue to embrace new and emerging technology. As noted in the interim white paper, financial institutions have largely demonstrated their operational resilience in the face of this hazard. But we are not done. Uh, there are characteristics that are specific to pandemic scenarios. First, we could see the pandemic coming. So response times could be measured in days or weeks, allowing for financial institutions and authorities to better plan and consult prior to deciding a course of action. Second, uh, financial institutions were affected in a manner that was symmetrical. The pandemic has had a galvanizing effect for the sector as we were all facing the same set of circumstances. Uh, third, the supply chain was affected in a manner that was symmetrical. Since supply chains were dealing with the same set of operational impacts, attempting to switch providers in the pandemic did not necessarily offer a better situation. We talk about the impact of cyber events, and recently we have seen increased intensity in certain attacks within the threat landscape. The characteristics of a material cyber event are fundamentally different than those uh, that we suffer through a pandemic. Uh, going back to uh, the last three uh, points that I made, uh, response times. 
a material cyber event may require response times that are measured in minutes or hours instead of days or weeks. Second, you'll have asymmetrical impacts. A financial institution or a sector may create impacts that require business operational responses uh, by other institutions or sectors that were not directly impacted by the event. And third, uh, third party impacts. A cyber attack on a critical service provider may create an impact on the subset um, uh, of market sectors, also creating uneven impacts to different jurisdictions. For these reasons, financial institutions, the Financial Stability Board, financial authorities, and standard setting bodies must continue to forge ahead on plans that enhance the industry's uh, resilience to cyber events recognizing that our preparedness for a pandemic response covered only a portion of what is necessary. Thank you for allowing my comments. I'll pass the floor back to you, Greg. Thank you, you're on mute. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. So let me now turn to Denya to discuss leading examples of industry preparedness and crisis management. Uh, this is an area that FSB highlights where continued steps are needed. So, Danette, the floor is yours. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Grace. I took a slightly different tact in, in preparing my, my comments today um, based on the kind of the desire for us to actually look at maybe some real examples of success in terms of preparedness, what are those factors that led to kind of our, our responsive successes? as well as you know, running to bring some you know, clear examples. I actually did a survey of about 300 of um, American Banker Association members here in the United States about their experience. And I asked them one question, which was, what would you identify as really your top success in terms of pandemic response and preparedness? And what were the factors that, that led to that success? Kind of looking in, in a little 2020 hindsight. And what I saw that came out of, of those responses were really three overarching themes. Understand that we're kind of limited on time. I'm going to go over those in kind of a bit of a superficial way, but happy to dig in though into um, into these examples a bit more detail, Grace, at your invitation during the discussion. So the three the three overarching themes that came through was the importance of planning and preparedness, looking at that as a tool to support a rational crisis response. So in the middle of what can be an emotional and kind of high stress scenario, can we do our planning and preparedness in such a way to give us tools to make rational decisions in the middle of sometimes of these, you know, again, these, these uh, emotional moments. The second overarching, overarching theme was those institutions that were, had the capacity and the ability to be culturally agile, to be flexible and bring to their response an aspect of creative problem solving in the moment, not just look at relying on their checklist, but on reasonable judgment, resources, available, you know, people and hardware. How do you respond in the moment to the event that's, that's handed to you? And having the cultural agility to do that was an important part of that response. And lastly, and this seems a bit, you know, obvious is a pre-existing familiarity with, you know, remote work, virtual platforms and cloud-based tools. Those banks that had already used those tools, either in terms of it was part of their culture to have a large you know, work remote opportunities, or as, as part of their own business kind of continuity and response, they've done this before, maybe even in response to weather. But working from home and having to do that very quickly was not something that was completely uh, novice, novel to them. So in terms of just planning and preparedness, what are these rational tools to assist us with crisis response? I had more than one institution say they realize the importance of having a robust business impact analysis to support that crisis decision making, especially when it came to prioritization and allocation of resources. So you're not necessarily either making emotional, emotion-based allocation of resources, or you have a response if you have some like a board of director who wants their laptop today, but based on your, on your business impact analysis, you understand that those limited laptops need to go to your business development people or your frontline you know, uh, staff, and maybe your board of director, those individuals can wait another couple of days or another week. 
the importance of tabletop exercises, especially for those institutions that when we saw what the pandemic was starting to occur in Asia, they took those variables, brought them in, did a tabletop exercise and with their own staff and brought those kind of variables that we were seeing, those real life variables into their current pandemic tabletop exercises. So that meant they were already kind of table topping, having to do a full time work remote, even if they had never done that before. And also realizing just the, the importance of removing principles from those exercises, because in the pandemic, your leaders may be sick, they might be absent, they might not be reachable. So understanding um, and, and also realizing the importance of these virtual dashboards to doing even something like a tabletop exercise, because what they realized in the middle of some kind of crisis, the likelihood you're going to be able to get everybody into a boardroom to do some kind of group decision making isn't isn't very practical. What's like probably going to happen is some people will be on the phone, some people will be on Zoom, some people will be in the boardroom. So actually planning their tabletop exercises with those same variables was really important and more kind of, again, reflective of real life. The other one that came up in terms of preparedness was building your relationships and your communication channels prior to the crisis. This was even realizing one new, re new relationships was, was needed. It's not just law enforcement. When we're looking at something like health, and pandemics, having the relationship with your federal kind of disaster agencies, your local health agencies, local uh, local and federal health agencies, those relationships became much more important than necessarily law enforcement, where the focus has always been in terms of you know cyber and risk management. Um, the role of you know just your trade associations, your banking agencies, to share information broadly, you know, an easy, efficient way to disseminate information quickly was not necessarily from banking agency to institution, but oftentimes banking agency or federal coordinators, those uh, banking trade associations, either state or federal, and then having that kind of common thread of communication to those institutions who were in the middle of, again, of responding to a crisis. The second point being the importance of being culturally agile and open to creative problem solving. There was you know, one thing that did come through was the importance of the supervisory assist uh, and the shift that we've seen in the last couple of years, moving away from this kind of philosophical reliance on compliance and checklists to this more of a risk management exercise of regional judgment, allowed banks in the moment, again, to be agile and flexible in their response to this crisis. We'd just been told you have to rely on, on the checklist if our, our responses had to be was judged by this very prescriptive uh, frameworks, we wouldn't have the capacity to be so flexible. Um, and this really, you know, what we were seeing is those institutions that had the ability to integrate their prior responses. So again, we'd never been full-time remote for 18 months, but we'd done it for a couple of days after a blizzard or a snow event, you know, in a city like Chicago, it wasn't completely, you know, removed from their reality. Managing supply chain disruptions, even like scarcity, again, the ability to rely on something like your your BIA to drive those allocation prioritization deployment was important in those moments. And, um, and the other thing that came through a lot is the ability for a bank to understand how to meet their staff, where their staff currently were in terms of their needs and availability. What we saw at least in the US with this full-time remote means the schools were closed. We had a lot of, you know, kind of multi-generations under one roof, um, all making demands on the internet. And how do you actually uh, respond to your employees' ability to work under those situations. That might mean that they're working different hours, um, just being al allowing people to be camera off um, to reduce bandwidth. They also realized that this flexibility in terms of being able to work remote and in hours actually gave them some more tools in terms of retention of their current workforce. And that became really important. That Again, that a flexibility to actually work with their own staff. And, and the other thing we were, were hearing in terms of cr creativity is Many institutions when going into really their crisis planning in general, didn't expect the kind of increase in demand for you know, mortgages, refi. We saw a lot of, of um, demand go up in our, our kind of home sales, um, as well as a lot of the stimulus programs uh, for focus on small businesses. So they had not anticipated how much of their kind of crisis response would also have to make sure that their employees had the resources they needed to for these new kind of market demands that really weren't in their kind of initial, you know, wasn't on the checklist, so to speak. And then the last point being this, you know, this is the obvious one, is that familiar the familiarity with remote virtual cloud-based tools. You know, 
it's kind of an obvious one. Those institutions that already had digital meeting platforms, their staff was familiar with those platforms. They understood the risks. They had already been able to test and assure their staff's work from home capacity. You know, did they have internet? Did they have available laptops? Whether it was their own or provided by the institution, but they knew there was a capacity to send people home and the bank would still be able to function. Those institutions made this transition easy, um, you know, in, in an easier way. I would note too, as we're looking at things like concentration risk around technology and data and use of cloud, that the agencies really should be thoughtful about what are the potential unintended consequences as we start to regulate these tools? Could it potentially undermine the ability of, of our institutions to respond and recover? Would it undermine their ability to be, you know, agile and flexible and creative because of these concerns around something like, you know, brand name risk? So with that, you know, those are getting grace. Those are kind of the three overarching themes that came up in our review of, of operational <laughs> risk and uh, success. But I would turn the call back to you. Thank you. Many thanks, Danyet, for that comprehensive overview and real life experiences. Um, now I'll turn to our third guest speaker, Sasha. Um, we have asked Sasha to speak about stress testing, including on the design and use of such tests by authorities. Sasha. Um, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. So um, I would like to make uh, three uh, brief remarks in these three minutes. Um, and the first to connect somewhat to what has been also discussed in the, in the, in the first session, so to speak. Um, so the first um, point um, that has been raised, actually, where I'm not so clear about was a statement uh, banks are sufficiently capitalized and stable um, as they have entered the, um, the pandemic last year. Um, and, and maybe the US is to, or US banks are to some extent better capitalized, but I think the European counterparts definitely not. Um, I mean, this becomes obvious, for example, if you look at the, the discrepancy between um, kind of what's, uh, what's reflected in, in book capital ratios relative to what, what market data says, while book ratios might have gone up, the situation in terms of market value has substantially been getting worse um, over the over the couple of years. Um, so it's not clear. And, and one of the, the reasons um, or, or, or things and which 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 are uh, probably responsible, but also which hasn't really changed also in the design of the stress test, particularly in Europe, is the extent, okay, what is the sort of how do you want to benchmark that? How do you want to actually figure out which banks are good or badly capitalized? Um, and what kind of benchmarks, benchmark capital ratios um, do you actually want to do? Um, and then a couple of other uh, points that have been mentioned already before, um, um, for example, um, uh, missing are the, the, the stress test to microprudential, where's the microprudential uh, component, and, uh, and, and what is the sort of the effect of, of, of networks and spillover effects and so on and so forth. All of these things uh, haven't really changed yet. Uh, the second point is um, also I'm not so clear about the statement. Uh, banks have been able to meet all the demand for lending that has come up in uh, during the pandemic. Um, if you look at it, because I think there's two two things worth mentioning. Definitely, one is um, sort of even if you look into the in the US, uh, this might be particularly true for large firms which have not really had any problems in accessing capital either through new lending or after the, uh, the massive response from the, uh, from the monetary policy, as well as from the fiscal authorities through the bond markets uh, and also through the use of credit lines. But there seems to be a very asymmetric effect that the use of lending uh, by smaller firms uh, has substantially gone down. Um, and I think there's the usual problem to identify what supply versus demand effect. But if you look at sort of the, the level of, of loan spreads or loan yields, which has substantially increased and hasn't come down yet relative to bond yields, which are at lowest at ever lowest point, so to speak, I think suggests that there might be some issues still in the loan market or in, in the banking sector, which, which are still worthwhile uh, looking into. The second part um, is, for example, the use of guaranteed lending. Uh, which has uh, come, uh, which has gone up. Particularly in Europe, there are some banks which have relied entirely of guaranteed lending. If you look at France as an example, the recent EBA disclosure suggests that the amount of guaranteed lending by French banks is roughly six percent of GDP. 
Uh, and I think there are definitely at least two issues uh, worth highlighting. The one is, of course, the substantial government put that comes along with that, that weak banks basically just put the weak loans on the balance sheet, so to speak, of the government, risking the increase in, uh, in zombie lending. And that uh, comes together with a substantial increase in leverage on the part of the corporate sector. So the third point, and this is actually my main point that I wanted to make, is uh, I think a risk which has has um, basically emerged last year, which hasn't been paid much attention to, particularly also not in stress tests, and that's actually coming from the drawdown risk of credit lines. Right. So if you just look at the number of the uh, U.S. publicly listed firms, the credit line. Um, access that they had through the banking sector in 2009 up to the global financial crisis was 0.7% of GDP. That has increased to 5.7% of GDP by 2019, right? While, and while the usual um, idea is, okay, banks provide liquidity to firms, which of course is a good thing, I think, which has been completely unnoticed is the massive amount of aggregate risk which has basically accumulated on bank balance sheet over the last couple of years and that risk has materialized last year because that's not longer um, um, a liquidity that's provided to the firm. This is a full range of full blown guarantee that's provided to capital markets in the case of rollover risk, which is exactly what has happened last uh, last year in March. Right. And this is also what kind of explains helps to explain why bank stock prices, for example, have so particularly crashed and underperformed corporate stock prices throughout the entire year. Um, and, and, and here, the, 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 main re, the main point, I think, and this is where this relates to stress test, is a, is a, is a lack of capital and, 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 uh, and, and the uh, sort of the, um, the missing a capital requirement that's coming through the stress test. And I think that problem has even increased because with the with the sort of like um, access to the bond market that has um, been uh, re re restored in, in the second and third quarter last year, credit lines have been repaid. So this massive drawdown risk is actually still there and has even increased because credit lines have gone up, but also the corporate leverage has gone up, right? So in the case, we have a similar shock that we experienced last March, the impact on the banking sector, including implication on the supply of bank loans, particularly small firms, will even be magnified compared to what has happened last year. So this is why this sort of like contingent capital risk is something which need to be included in stress tests going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha, Tanya, and Jason for your insights and willingness to help kick off the discussion. So for the remaining time, um, I'd be interested in hearing more views on financial stability lessons related to operation resilience and crisis management preparedness. I will open the floor to our audience. I have just um, I understand that it's um, a bit challenging for those who are listed as attendees um, to raise their virtual hand. And if you are having difficulty, please um, send a chat to Claire Rowley, who is the host of this WebEx call, and she will upgrade you to a panelist, and then you will be able to more easily uh, raise your virtual hand. So I see we have a comment from Anil Kashap. Anil? Um, just, just pulling what Joshua just said. I think one thing that's been lost in this the stress test uh, discussion is, if, if you went back to 2008 or 9, I think a lot of people advocating for stress tests were pushing for this idea of reverse stress tests being a central part of the stability framework, where you basically get after banks to produce credible living wills, and then you look for concentrations in the uh, risk that they identified and try to build that more into the stress test. That doesn't seem to be happening in most jurisdictions. And I don't quite understand why. Nobody seems to oppose it in principle, but when you just look at how these things are done, uh, they, that doesn't seem to be the way we do it. it. It seems more that the authorities come up with a scenario and then we push everybody through it and try to figure out you know, what would happen. But um, maybe it's just we don't have the bandwidth to do all that, but I think that's a, an important gap in what we're doing. We're not really learning and being able to keep up with the evolution of the banking system. And one of the ways that you would is to, to go ahead and use more of the reverse stress tests to be fed into the process. Okay. Thank you, I know. Um, Martin Bohr, 
Thank you, Grace. I'm Martin Boer from the Institute of International Finance. I just wanted to add a few points on the cyber risks during COVID that uh, Jason Harrell uh, just addressed. I mean, the bad news is that we have seen an expansion of, uh, of the attack vector at financial firms during COVID-19, as in all other industries. Uh, we've seen an increase in phishing and spoofing on both employees and customers. And it's often the same adversaries as from a before COVID, but under a sort of a COVID wrapper as Jason also alluded to. Some of the estimates we've seen is that these attacks have increased by 300% on the financial sector. And if you see cases like SolarWinds and the Microsoft Exchange uh, server breaches recently, that also highlights the risks coming from third party vendors and from supply chains, which is likely to lead to uh, tighter regulation and supervision going forward. We think that the FSB work, especially around third parties and outsourcing is really important here. What's also notable is that the cost of network attacks is doubling basically every two years, and it could reach as much as six trillion by the end of this year. But global cybersecurity investment is only around 160 billion. So you're seeing a really big imbalance in the resources between how we're defending ourselves and what they're taking from us. So that further underscores, I think, the importance of effective incident reporting and information sharing, both between uh, banks, uh, financial firms, and authorities. One other thing I wanted to mention, which hasn't been mentioned yet, is ransomware attacks. Uh, we've seen a very sharp increase in ransomware attacks, probably ninefold over the last year or so. The fact that these adversaries now want to be paid in crypto, and not in Bitcoin, but things like Monero and Zcash and Ethereum, also makes it difficult for law enforcement to track, trace, and to apprehend cyber criminals. So we saw that we have a Colonial Pipeline and Irish Health Services and a JBS. So, so there's a lot of questions now and minds are focused in terms of how do you react? Can you pay? Should you pay? Uh, what happens if you don't pay? And I think it would be helpful to get more clarity also from the authorities in jurisdictions in terms of what is allowed and what we should do. So very much a greater call for, I think, common and consistent approaches. Um, uh, the FSB's work on, for example, um, cyber incident reporting, making it more consistent and coordinating it throughout the crisis. And afterwards, I think is, I think is also really important. So, um, so thank you for giving me a few minutes, Grace. Thank you very much, Martin. Next, we have Mark Bruns. And after Mark, we'll have Richard Metcalf. Mark? And Danielle and I have discussed this. Um, one of the big things that helped for us is it wasn't overly legislated. So we literally went from in the office to at home over a weekend. We had the freedom to do the things we need to do to be successful and giving this trust that at the back end of it, we would take care of the cybersecurity things we needed to. So just having that freedom without having a lot of boundaries and around us really helped to speed things up and make it more successful and having the trust that we would take care of it also made a big deal. So that's just the one comment. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Richard? Hi, yes, thank you very much. Um, I won't go on video, excuse me that, excuse me for that, just trying to save bandwidth. Um, I want to just share some uh, perspective which we at the World Federation of Exchanges have gained from looking at operational resilience again. We were, we were very attuned to it at the time during the Northern Hemisphere spring last year um, because we recognized that, you know, the, there was likely to be quite a test of the exchanges and CCPs, but more broadly. And that indeed did prove to be the case. As everybody knows, there was a pretty significant surge in volume as well as volatility which tested the, the, the broader system in a number of ways. And of course, it was that volume and, and, and volatility that, that drove the increase in margin requirements as well, as, as I think the FSB's own review, holistic review of the, the March market showed, most of that was coming through in, in variation margin anyway. But the broader point is there was a huge surge in volume and that did lead to issues in back offices um, you know, this is the classic front office, back office divide. 
in a new guise, it seems. And that's that's certainly what we're seeing consistently. Some exchanges had to shut, but that was uh, because of issues to do with government restrictions on movement. So there is a lesson perhaps in there to be learned in terms of what processes, processes exist to ensure that relevant staff can go in and, and keep the machines turned on, as it were. Uh, but the bigger, the much, much bigger issues do appear to be in terms of, of back office, either sheer volume issues or volume related issues in terms of making sure that things like allocations and give ups can happen in, in a prompt fashion. And we're not we're not saying this as a sort of way to say, oh, no, you know, don't just look at that issue and just look at brokers or, or indeed um, some some buy side. Uh, but more to stress, I think that you need to look across the system as a whole just as you do when you're talking about pro-cyclicality, because as somebody very wisely said earlier, there are underlying issues to do with the collateralization across the system as a whole that tend to drive these things. So I just thought that perspective might be uh, useful for, for people thinking about these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any of the hands raised right now. So while people are contemplating what their intervention, I'd like to ask a question to our guest speakers. So um, all three of you had mentioned or discussed supply chain management. So what lessons can be drawn from the COVID event on how to more effectively manage supply chain risk, particularly single point of failure risk due to concentration, as many institutions have increased reliance on, for example, cloud service providers. I think, Danyette, you touched on this a little bit. Um, I don't know if you could elaborate some more on supply chain management. Sure, I think we can look at that two different ways. I mean, you're looking at the a number of institutions spoke in terms of supply chain and just hardware. You know, did we have enough laptops to send everyone home? Um, and what we were also seeing around that same time was the number of what was available in terms of computer hardware because everyone was going home at the same time was that you know, not every institution can make sure that everyone who was suddenly remote had a bank issued piece of hardware to work from. So that actually gave us, um, you know, and that goes back to that, you know, that BIA, the importance of the BIA, that they were able to make resourcing and allocation decisions based on kind of rational decision-making and not who had the loudest voice or who whined the loudest wanting their new toy at, in, a, in a work from home environment. So there's that piece from, a uh, kind of a rational um, hardware perspective. The other piece looking at from a cloud perspective and what has really come through is and it was those two pieces. One which was about if we're looking at supply chain and concentration risk, we have to be really thoughtful about how we're using the concept of concentration risk that was developed kind of outside of data and technology and bringing those concepts in. Because what we do see, especially with something like use of cloud and data, and, and the kind of provision and um, holding of data is that our ability to move data, replicate data, duplicate data, hold it on-prem across a selection of data centers is a really different environment than something like lending concentration or even something like, you know, we can things are over leverage or even market forces in terms of Wall Street. Our, this idea of single point of failure because, you know, you can look at your know, brand name, be it like an AWS, a Google, um, is that brand name enough to actually see real concentration or is the concentration, the diversity, the ability to, to diversify data in terms of, uh, at least with like cloud and, and other technology, is those, do those same vulnerabilities still actually exist? And I do, you know, from our perspective, um, the issues around cloud, con the issues around concentration do not Readily, readily and neatly apply to, especially to data and kind of use of cloud. And I, that does feel like we need to really wrestle with the application, the over application of that concept because the way that data is, is so mobile. As someone once said to me, we've seen concentration in computing since IBM invented the, main, the mainframe in the 1930s, and we haven't necessarily seen the level of concentration risk that we'd expect. So we should really examine that in a really close way. Again, looking at this from a, a responsiveness perspective is creating these kind of artificial concerns around concentration risk, applying them to data and technology. Do we also then constrain the ability of an institution to make quick, flexible, creative decision making in response to an immediate crisis? And that's not necessarily clear that those two things will work hand in hand. <laughs> 
Thank you, Danya. Jason, I see your video on, so I, I assume you want to make an intervention. I, I do, I, and, and I, thank you, Grace. So, and and Danette made it already made the point around around the uh, the technology. I guess the other things that I would say of, around lessons that we've learned is um, about the employee displacement um, from a work environment to these non homogeneous uh, home networks. You know, they also change the internal network traffic profiles, uh, which may force financial institutions to alter the way that we actually uh, secure our networking resources and networking environment. So for example, um, if we have anomaly-based intrusion detection, the changing in the network patterns may require us to recalibrate those systems in order to provide the same amount of, of protection. Um, you know, when devices are in the office, uh, it's easier to execute things like patch management strategies so as financial institutions, we've had to look at how do we conduct patch management when devices are intermittently connected to uh, the network. I think uh, the other thing is we, we learned the importance of our internal and external partnerships and collaboration. I think at the, you know, from the first session, uh, we already outlined the rigorous external collaboration between uh, financial authorities and institutions that was needed to get us to this point in the pandemic. I think we also understand the importance of uh, that same level of collaboration as we try to return to uh, pre-pandemic environment. Uh, but we also require the collaboration and flexibility uh, between our business operations, IT, risk, uh, and other support areas uh, to deliver processes that were normally conducted in person. So employee onboarding, home printing, client signatures, and how do we then use electronic signatures? I think all of these had to be negotiated through the pandemic. And I would say lastly, one of the things that we learned was that pandemic policies enforced by different nation states could impact the fi financial institutions and the supply chain. Uh, some nation and state pandemic policies together with the financial institution's own policy. So, for example, uh, the removal of remote access uh, by third party suppliers uh, created operational impacts due to employees not having access to the resources required to do their jobs. I see that Barbara Nova has her hand raised. Barbara? Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add one thing, which is that the regulators played a very important role and their flexibility in terms of operational resilience was quite critical. If I compare the great financial crisis and the COVID crisis, a couple of things were readily apparent. Number one was the coordination and collaboration across regulators, both within countries and globally. Um, very fast response time as a result. Second was the market savvy, I'll call it, that every regulator has more people focused on real time, what is happening in the markets and very much um, monitoring that so that decisions can be made that address real problems and choke points and, and some of the things we saw. I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, one was on the corporate side, approving the use of remote board meetings very, very quickly as we were entering the board meeting season um, as COVID was breaking out. Um, second one was in the case of mutual funds, um, allowing a wider band for swing pricing than some people used on a normal basis. So that ability to monitor what's happening real time, respond quickly, and then do it in a collaborative way across agencies made a huge difference. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, you touch on a, an important point and a point that's raised in our report about
how cooperation and information sharing needs to be enhanced. And I would be curious to hear other views on, um, on what has changed over the past 18 months on firms' relationship with their, with their authorities, whether the communication has improved. Um, anything along those lines of lessons learned would be helpful. Uh, just a reminder that um, for those who are attendees, if you would like to raise your hand, um, if you could send a chat to Claire Rowley. Um, otherwise, I don't see any other hands raised or any comments in, in the chat function. If I can least address what we were seeing coming out of the kind of survey and the feedback that we got, if that would be helpful on this point. Um, one of the things that was mentioned more than once was the uh, quick kind of pivot from on-site exams to remote exams. That that was actually very helpful for institutions that made their employees feel safer as well as allowed um, a different way to kind of interact with their authorities. With, I would also note it also allowed a testing of some of the systems that we've been discussing in terms of remote exams, but had not really, you know, engaged in a more robust manner. So we are hopeful to see maybe gave, again a cultural shift and having more remote exams than what we've seen up until now. Um, I would also note that that seems to be one of the upsides of the uh, pandemic response and recovery is that some of these innovations that we've been kind of toying with have now become, you know, more day to day and a, and a real part of our operations. The other thing that, that came through is, and, and Mark Bruns mentioned this, you know, in his comments earlier was that the early day in the early days of the pandemic, and as we moved into a kind of a work from home posture, the light touch of the banking agencies was very important. It did foster the sense of trust with the banks that there was a, a sense that the banks had the tools that they needed to move their move through their response and recovery and the agencies were there to support. That breathing room was necessary as it allowed the institutions to find their way based on individual risk, their immediate resources. Um, without creating regulation or overmanaging kind of a prescriptive process. And then once the process is stabilized, you know, definitely within, you know, the first couple of weeks, if not the first 30 days, the agencies began to put these additional controls in place. We got those pieces of guidance saying, you know, if you're going to be in cloud, if you're going to be at work from home, where are these new risks? And, and so it was that that bit of breathing room in those early days was very essential. I will note too, that as we're looking towards doing some more work um, around incident notification we're hearing a similar response from industry that in the initial days of an incident a bank's resources need to be focused on response and recovery not on compliance and reporting so it might be another another opportunity for us to look at this the appropriateness of this light approach and it may be similarly appropriate in order to allow the banks to respond and recover recover to the immediate incidents at hand Thank you. Thank you very much, Danette, and to everybody who has contributed to this discussion. Um, Dietrich, uh, I don't see any other hands raised or comments, so I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Grace. And uh, this, this brings us to the end of today's workshop. Um, let me, let me join Grace in, in, in thanking uh, those who contributed to the discussion today, and uh, in particular uh, to those uh, who led us off our lead discussions for, for sharing their, their insights today. Um, I've heard a number of interesting points during the discussion um, on buffer usability and uh, potential obstacles to, to, to using buffers on issues in, in non-bank financial intermediation, including questions around interconnectedness and the sources of, of systemic, systemic liquidity risk, um, and on how to think about operational risk and cyber risks um, along, along the supply chain. So I won't try to uh, draw any conclusions from the discussion, but we've taken good note uh, of the discussion to ensure that we consider your feedback as um, we move forward with our work and revise the report on, on les lessons learned. So um, with that, again, thanks uh, to all of you for participating and for your contributions. And uh, stay safe and goodbye.